Everyone says nuclear propulsion is the future of space travel, the key to getting us to Mars and beyond. So why haven't we seen a single rocket using that technology yet? Not even from NASA. This is the problem of the nuclear engine. The solar system is vast and traveling from one planet to another takes a lot of time, even with our best technology. Imagine you wanted to visit Mars using a traditional chemical rocket. First, you'd launch from Earth and enter low Earth orbit. Then, at just the right moment, you'd fire your engines again to escape Earth's gravity and begin your journey toward Mars. This maneuver puts you on an elongated path around the Sun that eventually intersects with Mars's orbit about six to eight months later. This method of interplanetary travel is called a Hohmann transfer orbit. It's the most fuel-efficient way we currently know to move between planets using the least amount of propellant while maximizing how much cargo, like scientific instruments or astronauts, you can carry. But efficiency comes at a cost. Time. An eight-month trip means astronauts will need a steady supply of food, water, and oxygen. They'll also be exposed to harmful cosmic radiation for the entire duration with limited protection, and that's just one way. Returning to Earth doubles the time, the exposure, and the supplies needed. These are some of the biggest challenges we face when planning long-term human missions beyond Earth. So, we need to go faster. But the sad thing is, over the past 50 years, engineers have pushed conventional chemical rocket engines to their absolute limits. Take SpaceX's Raptor engine, for instance. Elon Musk once said it's already hitting 99% combustion efficiency, and improving beyond that would take divine intervention. In other words, we're pretty much maxed out. If we're serious about making regular, reliable trips to Mars, it's going to take more than just refinements. We need a breakthrough, a leap. That's where nuclear propulsion comes in. To be fair, nuclear propulsion isn't a new idea. Back in the 1960s and 70s, NASA and the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission ran a program called NERVA, short for Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Application. The goal was to harness the heat from a nuclear fission reaction to power spacecraft. While no nuclear engine ever actually flew, NERVA produced some impressive results. It pushed forward reactor design, advanced turbo machinery, improved fabrication techniques, and even refined high-temperature electronics. And NASA didn't stop there. Over the years, they've continued to research and test nuclear propulsion technologies, gradually laying the groundwork for future missions. So, where do things stand today? Right now, two main types of nuclear propulsion systems are at the center of development. Nuclear Thermal Propulsion, NTP, and Nuclear Electric Propulsion, NEP. In a conventional liquid-fueled rocket, thrust is produced by mixing fuel and oxidizer in a combustion chamber and igniting them. The resulting high-temperature gases rapidly expand, increasing the pressure inside the chamber and forcing the exhaust out through the nozzle at high speed, generating thrust. Nuclear Thermal Propulsion, NTP, works on a similar principle. It expels hot gas to produce thrust, but the key difference lies in how that gas is heated. Instead of chemical combustion, an NTP system uses a nuclear reactor to generate heat. Here's how it works. Hydrogen fuel is pumped through a reactor core containing enriched uranium-235. Inside the core, a fission reaction takes place. Neutrons strike uranium nuclei, causing them to split apart, releasing energy, more neutrons, and creating a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. Each fission event releases about 190 to 200 million electron volts of energy, as well as additional neutrons and gamma rays. This intense energy heats the hydrogen gas flowing through the reactor. As the hydrogen expands and exits the nozzle at high speed, it generates thrust, just like in a chemical rocket, but with much greater efficiency. If the reactor is properly moderated, slowing down neutrons to sustain fission, and has sufficient enrichment of uranium-235, this chain reaction can be maintained steadily, allowing for continuous thrust during flight. Meanwhile, nuclear electric propulsion takes a different approach. Instead of using the reactor's heat directly to produce thrust, NEP systems use it to generate electricity, similar to how nuclear power plants work on Earth. This electricity is then used to ionize a gaseous propellant, such as xenon. Once ionized, 
the charged particles are accelerated by electromagnetic fields and expelled out of the engine at extremely high speeds, creating thrust. Nuclear propulsion, whether electric or thermal, can extract significantly more energy from a given amount of fuel than traditional combustion-based systems. They also help reduce weight because nuclear engines essentially do not need to carry oxygen for combustion. Overall, they're faster, more space efficient, and better suited for long-distance travel compared to combustion engines. Sounds like a dream, right? So why haven't we seen any rockets using them yet? First off, nuclear engines alone can't get us off Earth. It's true, they just don't pack enough punch. Think of it like the tortoise and the hare. Nuclear rockets generate much less thrust than chemical ones, but they can run continuously for weeks, constantly accelerating, ultimately reaching higher velocities. Nuclear electric propulsion would be even slower. Compared to nuclear thermal propulsion, NEP is like a sailboat catching a light breeze, while NTP is more like a speedboat. But for deep space missions, that steady, reliable pace could be exactly what we need. Well, nuclear engines aren't used on Earth anyway. After all, rocket engines are basically controlled explosions, and throwing a nuclear element into that mix ramps up the risk significantly. So, a nuclear rocket would be designed to operate only in space. To get it there, you'd need a powerful chemical rocket to launch it into orbit, which means the public would have to accept the risk of strapping a nuclear reactor onto a rocket loaded with explosive fuel. And rockets do fail, sometimes spectacularly. With a touch of dark humor, rocket scientists call it RUD, Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly. Nobody wants nuclear debris raining down over the coast, and that's not the only concern. Even an accident in orbit could release radioactive material into the atmosphere. These safety risks need to be fully addressed before any nuclear-powered rocket ever leaves the ground. In fact, space has already seen several nuclear accidents. In 1964, a Thor Abelstar rocket failed to reach orbit, destroying the Transit 5 BN3 satellite during re-entry over the Southern Hemisphere. The satellite's SNAP-9A radioisotope thermoelectric generator contained one kilogram of plutonium-238, which was released into the stratosphere. A 1972 U.S. Department of Energy report traced 13.4 kilocuries of plutonium-238 in soil samples back to this incident out of the 17 kilocuries originally on board. For comparison, global nuclear weapons testing released about 11,600 kilocuries of strontium-90. Then, in 1978, the Soviet satellite Cosmos 954, powered by a 45-kilogram highly enriched uranium reactor, spiraled into an uncontrolled descent. With an unpredictable crash site, authorities braced for the worst potential fallout over inhabited areas. The incident highlighted the real risks of launching nuclear materials into space and sparked global concern over emergency preparedness. It led to coordinated international protocols, including Operation Morning Light, a joint Canadian-American effort that recovered 80 radioactive fragments across a 600-kilometer stretch in the Northwest Territories. Cosmos 954 became a case study of why global cooperation and emergency planning are critical when dealing with nuclear-powered space missions. Nuclear contamination isn't the only concern. Orbital fission reactors can significantly interfere with gamma-ray observatories in space. When high-energy gamma rays interact with a reactor or surrounding materials, they can trigger pair production, creating electrons and positrons. These charged particles can then become trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, spiraling along flux tubes that carry them through various orbital altitudes. As positrons encounter other satellites, they can annihilate with electrons in the satellite structure, producing secondary gamma rays that can disrupt sensitive instruments. This kind of interference became especially notable in 1987, when the Topaz-Y nuclear reactors aboard the Soviet Warsat test satellite Cosmos-1818 and Cosmos-1867 interfered with gamma ray detectors on NASA's Solar Maximum mission and the University of Tokyo's instruments. Even if we managed to get a nuclear reactor safely far from Earth, traveling aboard a nuclear-powered spacecraft would still come with risks. As mentioned, it could shorten the trip compared to conventional engines, reducing overall exposure to cosmic radiation. But there's a trade-off. You'd also be exposed to radiation from the reactor itself. 
Is nuclear power really off the table? Not quite, just for now. Lately, we've made some significant strides toward making it a much more viable option. In 2020, the U.S. government brought nuclear spacecraft back into focus by awarding nearly $100 million to three major players, General Atomics, Lockheed Martin, and Blue Origin. The funding is part of the demonstration rocket for agile cislunar operations, Draco program, aimed at proving that nuclear thermal propulsion, NTP, can power rockets beyond low Earth orbit. DARPA's goal is to develop a system with thrust-to-weight ratios comparable to those of today's chemical rockets. Under the Draco program, General Atomics is tasked with designing the NTP reactor and creating a blueprint for the propulsion subsystem, while Lockheed Martin and Blue Origin are responsible for developing the spacecraft itself. The reactor would run on high-assay, low-enriched uranium, hail AU a special fuel made from recycled material from existing nuclear reactors. With enrichment levels capped at 20%, H-A-L-E-U can't be used to make nuclear weapons. Importantly, the reactor would remain inactive until the spacecraft reaches a nuclear-safe orbit. That way, in the unlikely event of a launch failure, any radioactive material would remain contained or harmlessly dissipate in space. Lockheed Martin has also partnered with BWX Technologies in Lynchburg to build the reactor and produce the HALEU fuel. If all goes to plan, Draco could see liftoff as early as 2027. Nuclear power isn't just about shortening travel times. NASA also has a dedicated program at its Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, focused on using nuclear fission, not solar energy or chemical fuels, to power spacecraft once they reach their destination. What about fusion, the process where hydrogen atoms fuse into helium, releasing vast amounts of energy? The sun has fusion figured out, thanks to its immense mass and extreme core temperatures. But for us, mere humans, achieving sustainable energy-positive fusion has been far more elusive. Massive experiments, like ITER in Europe, are working to crack that code, with hopes of sustaining fusion energy within the next decade or so. If that happens, it's not too far-fetched to imagine fusion reactors eventually being miniaturized to serve the same role as fission reactors in nuclear rockets. Like fission rockets, fusion systems would heat a propellant to extremely high temperatures and expel it to generate thrust. But the performance potential is dramatically higher. In theory, a fusion rocket could produce around 2.5 to 5 newtons of thrust per megawatt with a specific impulse of up to 10,000 seconds. Compare that to about 850 seconds for fission and just 450 for chemical rockets. It could also generate the electricity needed to power the spacecraft, especially useful far from the sun, where solar panels become much less effective. It's true that nuclear technology isn't quite ready for rockets, at least not yet. But what about the next few years? I expect we'll see new hardware, fresh designs, and real-world tests of nuclear thermal propulsion systems. And honestly, I'm incredibly excited about the possibility that fusion drives could one day carry us to other worlds.